all right so let's get started um i guess kind of talking about like how this entire thing really started off um this is in 2020 uh so every 10 years in america there is a census to understand everyone in america whether you know helping with budgeting with policies you know to see the the makeup of the people in america and um every 10 years um this year it happens to be that one every 10 years um is the census and this means every household is mailed a census letter you can also do this online to there's a whole entire campaign to help write in taiwanese taiwanese is not one of the check boxes that you can write you'd have to say other asians write in taiwanese um and this entire process really started off with uh taiwanese american citizens league which is the umbrella organization for tap chapters uh they had a convention kind of talking about this entire effort this entire campaign and instead of just talking about writing in taiwanese they want to kind of also like do a little bit of exploration into you know um, what does it really mean to be Taiwanese and Taiwanese identity or Taiwanese American? So that's really where this topic really started. After that, worked with the San Diego chapter, wanted to do it originally in, in person, going out of California. But, you know, I am, you know, doing it online now. This is great, you know, have uh, all the chapters from all over the world. Um, also, before we start, I am Eric Tsai. I am from Of Taiwan, OF Taiwan, uh, or OFT. And essentially, We've been around for a couple of years now. We re really help with, you know, getting information about Taiwan for English-speaking crowds, you know, primarily Taiwanese-Americans, but really anyone who wants to learn about Taiwan. And, you know, one of the things that we do, we do a lot of workshops with undergraduate organizations, um, with a lot of Taiwanese-American student organizations. We've been able to get into the professional scene a little bit more. But just like any workshop, I also want to start with a disclaimer, you know, none of us are professionals. We're not historians, journalists, or, or you know, specialties in these areas. But, you know, we do a lot of research. We try to figure out, talk to specialists as much as possible. And so, you know, because of that, though, you want to emulate the people that we hope to inspire as well, too. You know, the information is out there. It's hard to get. You know, that's why we're here. We're trying to help information out in English. But, uh, you know, we're trying to get them out. Hopefully people can be like us and just learn more as well. So, without further ado, I guess let's just get started. So, the biggest topic we want to talk about is, you know, you know, what does it mean to be Taiwanese? You know, defining Taiwan. And, you know, a lot of times people will talk about Taiwanese. People are like, oh, this is, this is a certain ethnicity, you know, a certain skin color, or, you know, certain, like, background, the language that you speak, you know, whatever it is. Or, honestly, what, or is it simply just the pride of being the inventors of bubble tea, for example? Or, you know, just all these great food. But, you know, first to be noted is that the Taiwanese identity, just like any other identity, is a self-identified self one. And, you know, so this means, you know, you can be, no one can tell you that you are not whatever you want to be. You know, unlike nationality, for example, nationality, there's a list of requirements, there are paperwork needed. Um, personal identity and cultural identity is very much your own. So what we're going to talk about next is going to be a little bit um, talking about people in different groups, the Taiwanese identity in different groups. And one thing to be noted, though, this is generalization. Um, you know, there are specific and unique histories and experiences with each of these groups and each individual people. These are generalizations to get a general idea of it. If you have a chance, if there's people around you, there's Taiwanese people around you, talk to them, talk to your grand, talk to your parents, gotta talk to your grandparents, talk to, you know, an international students or even fellow Taiwanese Americans, too. Everyone has their own stories. So, for the ease of discussion, though, we're going to break it into three separate kind of groups to, to discuss. First is going to be the indigenous people, then the Han and Chinese ethnicity pe Taiwanese, and then what I'm going to call the new Taiwanese. Um, if some of these terms don't really make sense, we kind of get it, um, we'll get into it, and you, know, you guys can kind of see how that goes. So first, we're going to talk about indigenous people. Um, when we talk about indigenous, uh, the indigenous people of Taiwan, indigenous Taiwanese, um, these are honestly the OG Taiwanese, you know. Um, but you know, people talk about Taiwan, they usually start with the story of um, their uh, Portuguese sailors, they were sailing by Taiwan, and they saw a beautiful island, they said Ilha Formosa, it's a beautiful island. And, you know, just like how Colombia never discovered America, Taiwan was not discovered by the Portuguese, you know. Um, Taiwan's history and, you know, it's, there are people in Taiwan even before that, before the name Formosa, even before the name Taiwan itself. And so, you know, we're going to talk about OGs right now. So first, there are many indigenous tribes in Taiwan, but only some are formally recognized. You know, there's only 16 that are, you know, recognized by the, the government. Um, and there's only three that's locally recognized. And then of those, there's only 10. 10 are actually not recognized at all. So of these 16, though, when you think about the 16, you're like, oh, you know, that's, that's a relative, you know, that's for a small island. There might be a nice 
good number of people. But, you know, this is only recent development. You know, I asked a Taiwanese-American friend of mine, you know, I was asking him, like, hey, you know, I'm trying to do a trivia thing, you know, I'm testing out some of these questions. How many indigenous tribes do you think there are? And he goes, nine. And I was like, oh, I'm like, like a little bit shocked. I was like, that's a little, kind of little. And I realized that, you know, he wasn't entirely wrong. At some point, it was nine. And also at that point, wasn't that long ago. I was growing up, you know, a lot. You talk, you talk to a lot about a lot of '90s kids in Taiwan. When you're growing up, there's this theme park that's called, that's literally called Nine Tribe Cultural Park, and this is supposed to be a, a amusement park or a theme park that is talking about the indigenous people. But yet, you know, in there, there's things about, you know, there's a European garden in there. There is like um, an area about Native Americans, and you know, this Nine Tribe Park still exists to today. But it wasn't until recently that they started recognizing more and more tribes up to number 16. And, you know, you might be wondering, well, then why are some only locally recognized and why are 10 just completely not recognized? A large part of these 16, most of them, uh, pretty much all of them, are of more mountain tribes. These are people who, they're more together, you know, they've been around for a very long time. And for the most part, throughout the, I guess, 100, hundreds of, uh, 100, 200 years or so, um, have not really been not touched by, you know outside world as much as the other tribes or rather the, rather the plains tribes so a lot of the plains tribes you know the the 10 that are listed here the 10 that are not recognized that a lot of them are plains tribes and they mingled with the people from the han ethnicity or people who came from southern china early on uh, but also at the same time because of this there are many studies and speculations that like you know about 80 percent of all taiwanese actually have indigenous blood within them so at some point, maybe it's so far back in their family tree that you might not be able to f figure it out, you know, um, there's probably some indigenous blood in them. And that's also the same point as to why, you know, there's a really unique part about Taiwan. And so this recognition, this, you know, this lack of recognition, rather, a lot of times comes with government benefits. There's a lot of fam uh, government benefits because the government does realize that Taiwan's not... No, the government, the Republic of China government, or the Taiwanese government, is not that great to indigenous people. Honestly, no one in the world really is, you know. So they want to give them benefits, and there's a lot of benefits. But one of the namely ones that people really hear about sometimes is, you know, it's early on is by being indigenous when you're taking the national exam to go to, let's say, enter college or you know, enter high school. You actually, you actually get added points. So this would be the equivalent of, let's say. On your SATs, you're writing, um, I am, let's say, if you write as Native American, you automatically get 100 points on your SAT. Uh, because Taiwan's exam is nas it's a national exam, they're adding that directly to the points. Granted, in America, there are systems where, you know, schools would take ethnicity or backgrounds into account, but that's not, that's not just added points. Uh, because of this, they're very reticent to add a lot of these, organiz uh, a lot, lot of these different tribes. This is also not a thing that's unique to just Taiwan. This is also a thing that, you know, happens with, with really indigenous people all over the world. Um, let's say, for example, in America itself, there's about 20 tribes in Virginia, for example, uh, Native American tribes, uh, but yet there's only one that is actually federally recognized. So this is a common issue around indigenous people. And not just the lack, the, the loss of, the loss of, name there's also a loss of land you know this is again an issue that happens with a lot of indigenous tribes and as you see right here on on the left you see you know map of taiwan the blue parts are kind of what their people call as the kind of people call as like the traditional territory you know these are people indigenous tribes as they go about they have you know their there's their hunting grounds, their sacred burial grounds, their their farm grounds, and also like where they live, where they fish. Um, but you know, as time goes on, you kind of see the blue represents what it used to be kind of traditional territory, but the yellow parts are kind of what is remaining of the reservations. There's a story that I heard once was um, you know a lot of these blue parts are starting to become like national parks as well too. So there's this one story about this um, this boy who was riding his you know his scooter up in the mountains and he's like I'm gonna go get you know. He, suddenly he sees this guy, this guard come over to him and be like, hey, like, you know, you can't go up there. He's like, why not? He goes like, you know, it's the National Park. You're not allowed up here. And the park is closed. And the guy's like, but this is this is my land. This is, you know, where my family, my, you know, my tribe has been coming here to pick bamboo shoots for generations. And because of these national parks have been created, you know, this kind of pushes a lot of the indigenous people out, takes a lot, a lot of lands. It's actually really similar to, you know, America, for example. Like, probably one of the biggest examples would be Mount Rushmore, for example. This is, again, land that's taken away from uh, Native American tribes. And not just, like, taking away land, though. Sometimes 
the government simply makes land unusable. For example, uh, there's an island off of, uh, off the main island of Taiwan. It's called Lanyu, and uh, or Orchid Island. And on the tr- on the island, there is a tribe called the Yami tribe. And but that island right now is nearly it's very it's not quite an, not quite habitable, um, not quite livable. It's simply because uh, the Taiwanese government or the Republic of China government has been dumping its nuclear waste onto the island itself. So it's been causing a huge disruption to the land and the people. Loss of land again isn't unique to dangerous people. This happens all over the world. You know, m- most you know, a couple of years ago, for example, there was a big case in in a, in America where there was a North Dakota pipeline and the Keystone Pipeline that they were trying to build over um, sacred land. And so this is an issue that happens really all over the place. But next, apart from loss of you know land, we're talking about loss of name. We're going to talk about a little bit next about the loss of dignity from these indigenous people. So next is going to, we're going to be watching a clip from one of my favorite Taiwanese films. It's called On Happiness Road. And it shows the type of stories that were taught to kids in the 90s. And you can kind of see why this causes people to kind of lose dignity in being an indigenous Taiwanese. Oh. <laughs> So, as you can see, you know, this type of, this story is about a man called Wu Feng. And Wu Feng was, you know, this, this story, first off, is made up. Um, this is debunked. Um, for example, the tribe would never hunt someone in red clothing. This person called Wu Feng never existed. But the story was actually concocted by, you know, in the Japanese era, when the, there was Japanese rule of Taiwan. And it's kind of show like the savagery of the indigenous tribes and sort of the benevolence of the rulers. Um, but this this wasn't real and you know this japanese era was from you know a rule of taiwan was from 1895 to 1945 but you know this was in textbooks until 1999 this kind of story you know was brought back by the republic of china government put in textbooks again to highlight the savagery of indigenous tribes and the benevolence of the rulers and you know there has been many protests by the indigenous taiwanese around these as well too so this is a sense of loss of dignity that causes a lot of people, they just feel bad and they feel ashamed of being indigenous. And then with the loss of name, land, and dignity, the government has, you know, has not been treating the indigenous Taiwanese well. It's been, you know, there are more efforts now to try to do things a little bit better. You know, it wasn't until 2016, August 1st, that, you know, there was a formal apology by the government to the indigenous people. You know, the... Again, only the 16 recognized tribes were, were brought there. But yet, you know, from then, the, even though the apology was issued, um, policies still haven't changed that much. There hasn't been as much help for those indigenous people. And before we close off on this area, I kind of also want to talk about, you know, there are many tribes that are not recognized. And, you know, they're probably not, you probably not heard their names as much. But there's one tribe that I do want to call out, you know, in case anyone ever asks, like, oh, like, what about one of the ten? You know, the one that I always refer to, this is a tribe that you hear their name a lot, actually, but unknowingly. So there's a tribe that's not recognized. It's called the Karagalan tribe. And some might find it familiar or not. But Karagalan, um, there is a street right in front of the presidential office in Taipei. It's called Karagalan Da Da, which is Karagalan Boulevard. And, you know, this is a tribe that was pivotal to driving out the Europeans um, from Taiwan, from northern Taiwan. Um, and that's why the, the boulevard was named after them. But yet, this wasn't, you know, the tribe itself is not recognized. So, next, we're going to move on to, I guess, you know, simply we're going to call it the Han or Chinese, Chinese ethnicity Taiwanese. Um, but, once again, if anyone's joining right now, uh, I'd like to 
thank you guys for joining and again if there's any questions we're seeing oh I'm, there's someone from minneapolis that's amazing as well too so you know if there's anyone who has any questions please pop into the live chat and you know definitely be discussions there i will be hopping on and replying to some questions or just answering them right here on the stream as well too so next we're going to talk about the han or chinese ethnicity taiwanese um when you think about taiwanese you know people stereotypically think about a face that looks like one of these for example you know um but the Han ethnicity, the reason why I'm using the word Han ethnicity or uh, Han or Chinese ethnicity is because, you know, there is heritage that comes, you know, from China. Um, the reason why I try to sometimes avoid the word Chinese, for example, Chinese is a very ambiguous word. It means it's a nationality, it's a language, it's a it's an ethnicity as well, too. So, you know, a lot of times we use the word Han, but, you know, words are interchangeable. One of the things that we really want to talk, talk about is, you know, this Han Taiwanese, this Chinese ethnicity Taiwanese, there's really a, a breakdown of these. There is terminologies that we that are commonly used. I don't like using them, but I'm going to explain what they are and the words I'm going to use instead. So the words are, there is something called Wai Senjuan Ben Senjuan, which is literally meaning people out of this province and of this province. I don't like these words because there's a slight connotation to like provincialness and not just that, but it's also sometimes used to talk about people in the sense of like, you're a foreigner, you're not really of Taiwan, for example. And you know, we're here about talking about identity, and, you know, really the ultimate thing is, like I said before, it's a self-identification. If you're Taiwanese, you're Taiwanese, whatever it may be. So the words I use instead do the magic of translation as well, too, because there is no real terminology for white sense and bun sense So I get to choose my own translations. So people who came, who were in Taiwan, you know, from the 14, 15, 1600s, you know, or really anyone before 1945, I'm going to refer to them as Han Taiwanese. You might know them as Ben Shenzhen. But if we're talking about people who came after 1945 or after the Chinese Civil War, I'm going to refer to them as Chinese Taiwanese. Um, this is hopefully to get a better understanding that, you know, ultimately we're all Taiwanese. It is just an adjective to a noun or just different styles of Taiwanese and different backgrounds. Times will have changed and we'll get to that a little bit later. So these two groups, though, um, while they kind of look the same, um, there's actually quite different backgrounds. And they kind of start... They start, because of these differences, and sometimes whether it's govern, governmental or, you know, prevent, or, or people of, of the people itself, there's slowly there are clashes between these two. So to understand how these clashes came about, um, we're going to talk about each group individually first, a little bit of the history. So we're going to fo focus on the Han Taiwanese. If you really talk about the Han Taiwanese, there's actually, there's a huge history that goes back, you know. Um, the reason there are so many Han ethnicity people in Taiwan is largely due to the times of Taiwan during the Chinese, his, the Chinese dynasties, you know, prior to, quote unquote, the European discovery of Taiwan, you know, there were indigenous people on the island. But there are also people from, for example, from China, southern China, and also people from Japan. Um, side note, Japan, essentially, they were there to make, to hunt deerskin for samurai armor. Um, but people in China, uh, people who came from China there, a lot of them were farmers and traders. Just a small sidebar, um, you know, when we talk about the Europeans for them, you know, occupying Taiwan, they didn't really occupy Taiwan. You know, the Spaniards had, you know, the northern Taipei area, you know, and then the Dutch had the more southern area. So they didn't really, like, control all of Taiwan or occupy all of Taiwan. Um, but eventually, the Europeans were driven out by a Ming dynasty loyalist called Koxinga. And many of these southern Chinese people started moving to ta Taiwan. Eventually, um, Taiwan was also handed over to the Qing dynasty. And which allowed for even more immigrants uh, from southern China. A lot of these were traders, farmers, seafarers, pirates, or I think they just called themselves seafaring merchants. Um, and so then it wasn't until 1895, after the Sino-Japanese War, that the Qing Dynasty lost to Japan and had to hand over Taiwan to the Japanese Empire. And slowly, this symbol, the Qing Dynasty symbol, translated over to the Japanese flag. And, you know, people talk about the, the Japanese era, so Japanese colonization of Taiwan was from 1895 to 1945. So this has been going on, you know, it's about 50, 50 years. Um, and people go like, oh, well, you know, the Japanese influence, like, kind of wanted, like, they don't see as much, you know, we're still very, very ethnically um, Chinese, and we're still, there's a lot of influence from China. Um, but one of the biggest influence, I have to say, is um, this building. Um, as you see the picture on the left, this is actually a picture um, by, you know, a, a group of, you know, high a class of high school girls uh, taking a picture in front of the Japanese, you know, I think, Director General's office in Taiwan. 
that same office is now instead of the Jap- the you know the head Japanese person in Taiwan now is actually the presidential building of the Republic of China government. And so you know times have changed, but some of these buildings there's still some small remnants of the Japanese coloni- colonization. And also during the 50 years of Japanese colonization, the Han Taiwanese, uh, they were put through a series of Japanization, you know, from schooling to speaking Japanese language, you know, for example, um, sound off if anyone, you know, hear their grandparents speaking Japanese. I know myself, my grandpa always boasts about how great his Japanese is. Um, I don't know his age or maybe he didn't, you know, follow that much, but he's like, hey, we go to Japan. He can say a couple phrases, but I think he might have, you know, forgotten some of those phrases speaking Taiwanese more. And so that's kind of, you know, the idea behind the Han Taiwanese. These are kind of unique, unique experiences that the Han Taiwanese have experienced. And it wasn't until 1945 that, you know, there started to be a different group of, you know, ethnically Chinese people that came to Taiwan. And, you know, we're going to start referring to them as the Chinese Taiwanese. So... As the new group came around, the Chinese Taiwanese, um, they actually didn't really see themselves as Taiwanese back then. Really, to them, their nationality or their identification was actually just as Chinese. And a large part comes with this flag. This flag, as many people know it, you know, is modern day seen as the flag that represents Taiwan. But there's also, if you talk to some people, people will say like, well, this is actually the Republic of China flag. Um, And, you know, both are right, and there's a little bit, you know, a little bit of validity to both of them. This flag was, is the Republic of China's flag. The Republic of China is an is a party and a nation that was founded in 1911 in China. And the biggest differentiation about this, and why some people in Taiwan don't necessarily say, yeah, that's kind of my flag, but not really my flag. Um, the clearest way to describe this is actually through World War II. So, World War II, 1945 marked the end of World War II. But it really comes down to these two flags. These two flags were fighting against each other. Republic of China was fighting with China. And at the same time, Taiwan was actually fighting for the Japanese Empire. So Taiwan was actually fighting for the Axis power. I know a lot of times, you know, I remember I was in college once. And it, was, it was Halloween and there's this one, there's this one American who was, you know, wearing a, a flight jacket, you know, air, one of those Air Force jackets. And in the back, it had the Republic of China flag. And, you know, I was in college and I was like, oh, dude, that's so cool, man. That's like, it's a Taiwan flag. Yo, yo, yo. And then I, I didn't realize that, you know, afterwards that, you know, that flag during World War II was actually seen as a, an enemy to the people from Taiwan. Um, but so during the entire time there, you know, you have to kind of think about the sentiment that it gets as gets to as well too. The people from Taiwan, the Japanese Empire, were killing people from people wearing the other flag, the Republic of China flag, and vice versa. This kind of evident in some you know Chinatowns as well too. So I don't really think about these flags as much um, when I was living in New York. Uh, I used to live in New York. There's one building that had a RLC flag. And I thought it would be, I was interesting, but, you know, not that interested to figure out why. It wasn't until I first came to Boston. You know, if you got everyone who, anyone who's visited Boston or, you know, people who are on here from Boston, um, when, you, when you go from the bus station over to Chinatown, you go past the Chinatown gate. And this is the Chinatown gate. Um, and you walk past, and the first thing you go like, wow, there's the ROC flag or the, the Taiwan flag. I'm like, I'm very surprised. You might see some of these flags a little bit here and there in, you know, all of the all of different Chinatowns, but this was, like, prominent. This was on the Chinatown gate. And so the, I, I immediately looked, looked it up, and the main reason why was because this flag represented China at the time, and a lot of people who came to Boston, you know, was, you know, flew this flag. This was their home flag, essentially. And so that's why sometimes this flag doesn't necessarily represent all of Taiwan either. It wasn't until 1945, at the end of World War World War II, um, General Order Number One was issued, and essentially this placed Taiwan underneath the control of General Chiang Kai-shek. But at the same time, while this is happening, you know, their China, General Chiang Kai-shek, you know, was also fighting the Chinese Civil War, fighting against co- Communist China. So after the war was over, the treaty was signed, but neither the you know the Chinese nationalists, like you know Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek nor the Communist Party were at the table during the treaty signing for Japan to hand over Taiwan or give up Taiwan. And so a lot of that was left very, very ambiguous. But as Chiang Kai-shek kind of lost or fled from China during the, after the Civil War, they actually came to Taiwan and set Taiwan as a base in order to you know, win back China, 
In order to do this, they put a, implement a lot of policies, you know, to try to make them more pro-China. During this time, you also have to remember, uh, Taiwanese people, people in Taiwan of Han ethnicity, they've been ruled by Japanese for 50 years. So they originally received the Nationalist Party with open arms, like, yes, you know, we're going to the motherland, we're, 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 we're returning back our Chinese roots. But there were still, there were oppression that, that came down. You know, one of the biggest ones is probably the loss of language. As the government came over, they wanted to implement Mandarin, or, you know, people would call it, like, Beijingese, for example. Um, and the reason why, you know, I'm sometimes referring to Beijingese is because the Mandarin that we know now, the Chinese that we know now, is spoken in northern China in, you know, Beijing area. Whereas a lot of people from Taiwan, they immigrated from southern China. So they were speaking Cantonese, they were speaking Hokkien, they were speaking Hakka. And so it kind of leads to a situation where there is a lot of, you know, government is trying to push a different kind of system in. Um, we're going to look, look at a clip where this actively happens in schools. And when it starts happening in schools, it, you know, leaves generations and generations going forward. You can kind of see the kind of um, implement, uh, kind of policies that the school implements in order to get people to not speak dialects. You know, they would actually have, you know, if someone spoke Taiwanese, they would actually, or Hakka or whatever, like local dialect, they'd actually have to hang a sign saying that, you know, I love speaking Mandarin. And they'd have to wear that sign until someone else spoke, you know, Taiwanese or whatever. And they'd ha they'll give this plaque over. And this kind of causes the kind of ostracization that happens between classmates. It's almost bullying, really. Um, this clip is a little bit, you know, it makes humor out of it. But if you really think about it, it's a little bit sad. So that's the sound of saying, I love speaking Mandarin. And now he's wearing a sign that says, you know, I like I like speaking Mandarin and I won't speak cuss words. So this kind of issue happens a lot of schools and you can see kind of like the the kind of bullying that happens, you know, people will ostracize people who spoke dialect, you know, Taiwanese or remember, this is not just Taiwanese, this is also people who spoke Hakka, for example. And so, you know, even nowadays, you know, I have a friend of mine that, you know, she grew up in Taipei and her family speaks Taiwanese. Um, but, you know, she grew up and she was like, I, I don't. I don't want to speak Taiwanese because it's seen as, you know, these are country bumpkins. These are, you know, farmers that speak it. These are gangsters that speak it. But remember, back in the days, these were, these were people who were doctors, who were lawyers. And so this kind of um, thought about, you know, Taiwanese, these dialects being very, very, you know, country bumpkin, uneducated, kind of reinforces people to kind of lose a little bit of their past identity. And, you know, that happens throughout. Large part is because, you know, um, like I also kind of explained later on, we'll talk about a little bit later on, about the Taiwanese American identity as well, too. And so to the Han Taiwanese, the Chiang Kai-shek and the Republic of China government, um, the Republic of China government, it's, it was seen as kind of like a symbol of repression. You know, uh, these are people that kind of oppress on the original Taiwanese identity. A lot of the Taiwanese traditions, you know, were not allowed. And the people of Taiwan started to seek kind of a self-identification. Um, but 
during this time, you know, white terror was, uh, there was a year in Taiwan called the white terror or martial law was imposed. It was imposed for a total of 38 years. And this martial law was really the government saying like, oh, we had to crack down everyone in order to retake China. Uh, because of this, they were using this as a way to crack down on a lot of Taiwanese intellectuals too. Um, these, that means people were, people were blacklisted, people were persecuted, thousands, millions, the really number is really unknown as to there's a lot of people who were murdered, who were taken out, out back and just shot and executed. So this, you know, the, the government, the Republic of China government, Chiang Kai-shek was kind of seen as kind of a symbol of oppression. And so right now I'm showing, displaying image of the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall where there's a huge Chiang Kai-shek statue there. And this is actually kind of similar to an American topic, for example. A couple of years ago, there was a Robert E. Lee statue in, um, in I think it was uh, Charlestown, Virginia. And they want to take down the Robert E. Lee statue. Obviously, part of it, people say like it's a part of history. But at the same time, it's also a symbol of oppression for a population of the nation. So this is a quite similar situation. Not the same, but you know, similar in certain terms um, to some of the issues that we have over here in the States as well, too. This kind of festered on, you know, this this antagonism between the two groups of people kind of grew, grew, and grew. And then until the 70s and 80s, the Taiwanese people, they wanted to be represented. You know, I remember at this time, the Taiwanese government was controlled by, it was a single party state. It was really just the Chinese Nationalist Party, you know, in the government, you know, controlled everything. People who were elected, uh, to be elected president, there was a council of people who got to select the next president. So there was no democracy that was here. Um, so in the 70s and 80s, slowly a group of you know, Han Times people gathered together and they started to form what is now known as the Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, which set as an opposition party to the Chinese Nationalist Party, which is the KMT. So this, is, this image here, for example, is from the Formosa incident in Kaohsiung. Um, this is in the, in the 80s. Oh, 70s, sorry. I think, I believe, 79. Um, in which, you know, Han Taiwanese people actually, you know, essentially was setting up a rally to to celebrate International Human Rights Day. And the Nationalist Party, the, the government essentially cracked down on them. You know, a lot of these people end up with riot police taking on the rally attendees. So this kind of festering identity and also, like, you know, just backgrounds of people, but also identity kind of start clashing. But what about now? You know, um, there's a huge growing trend, you know, of this growing Taiwanese identity. Um, so as you, this is this is a poll that was done by Zhenzhou University, and polling people about what they consider themselves as, whether the blue parts represent people who identify themselves as just um, Chinese, um, gray as both Chinese and Taiwanese, and orange as you know just Taiwanese. So this this kind of trend, as you can see from the 90s all the way until more recently, has been growing more and more wanting to be considered Taiwanese, and less and less is just pure Chinese. The band, both like Chinese and Taiwanese, is kind of a little bit mixed. And this is a growing identity that, that's, you know, like any identity, is kind of a growing situation. The reason why I brought this picture up in the very beginning was this is actually a picture of one, three generations of one family. So the man on the left is the grandfather, and he came with a nationalist party. And so to him, his identity is he is Chinese. That is what he is. Then as the second generation came about, you know, he was taught to not be Taiwanese. You know, he had a lot, you know, he saw the people around him, you know, there was this kind of blend of like weird Taiwanese and Chinese kind of identity. And now the third generation comes about, you know, he's proud to be Taiwanese, you know. So this, this identity growing from, you know, being Chinese to, you know, being ashamed of being Taiwanese to now almost like being proudly Taiwanese as well, too. Of course, nowadays, there's also a large portion of Taiwanese youth, you know, there's a huge debate around the ROC flag in itself. The ROC flag, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, it is an international symbol. There are people who go like, we understand the history behind it, but, you know, it's still our flag. Some people say, no, it's not our flag. So there's a growing debate, you know, with the flag, with identity um, going forward. While those are faces that's similar to that people think about Taiwan a lot, um, the next group of people, I don't think people talk about as much. And... There's going to be an umbrella term that I'm going to be talking about. It's called uh, New Taiwanese. Um, some people call them uh, new residents, new, new immigrants in Taiwan. Um, but these are really people who came from, who came to Taiwan and is now starting to have their second generation. A lot of times people talk about American identities. They're like, oh, Asian American, Taiwanese American. You know, it's, a, it's an adjective and a noun. But people don't talk about it in Taiwan. And you notice that each of these groups that we're talking about, it's an adjective and a noun. So these new Taiwanese, if you really want to break them down, they're like, 
Southeast Asian Taiwanese. There's Vietnamese Taiwanese, Cambodian Taiwanese, and then you know eventually even like American Taiwanese. So we're gonna take a, we're gonna look look at one little story about uh, Vietnamese Taiwanese and kind of um, see a little bit more from there. When they first made their appearance, Vietnamese brides in Taiwan were scorned as mail order brides. The discrimination continued for decades. But today, their children have become the new hope for the island's southbound policy. Channel News Asia's Victoria Jen reports. 20-year-old Chen Jingling is the daughter of a Vietnamese bride. Growing up, she never felt embarrassed by her mother's background. Now a sophomore at Taiwan's top university, she speaks Mandarin and Vietnamese fluently. She's been lucky. Although the daughter of a Vietnamese bride, she has not experienced the discrimination her mother faced. The 1990s saw a surge of Vietnamese brides like Jingling's mother marrying Taiwanese men, in part due to the former government's Go South policy. Taiwan's manufacturers were urged to invest in Southeast Asia, paving the way for the men to meet and marry. But it was Vietnamese brides who hit it off the most with Taiwanese men, their number far surpassing brides from elsewhere in Southeast Asia. Life here wasn't easy in the beginning due to the language barrier, but she was glad her kids were born and raised in Taiwan. So as we talk about this, you know, there is a growing sense of, you know, um, immigrants that now have second generations here. So there, you know, while in the 90s there were brides, migrant workers, um, now they're forming families. There's a lot of Vietnamese Taiwanese, Indonesian Taiwanese, and all those that are listed you can see right here in this chart. But new Taiwanese aren't just people from Southeast Asia or from mainland China. There's Westerners as well, too. You know, you've heard of Taiwanese Americans, but have you heard of an American Taiwanese? Um, you're gonna see one right now. That's what I like. Shooting hoops in Taiwan, not in his home country, the U.S. Quincy Davis loves Taiwan and likes to show it. He regularly posts pictures of his life on the island, including playing for Taiwan's national team, encouraging Taiwanese youngsters to play basketball, and traveling around the island on his scooter. Not just to only play basketball and become Taiwanese, I think you have to embrace the culture. So, um, you know, having scooters or riding scooters as a way of transportation, that's a way of life here. So um, I feel like it, it wouldn't look as good doing a, taking a visit, you know, riding around in my Mercedes Benz yes. or my BMW, you know, it just wouldn't fit it, so. Because of his affection for his adopted country, Davis used Photoshop to change a picture of his jersey to say Taiwan Taipei instead of Chinese Taipei after his team defeated Japan in a game in February. He then posted the picture on social media. That led to criticism from his Chinese fans, but praise from his Taiwanese fans who were touched by his patriotism. Um, I think it's very frustrating and that's where the, the photo, you know, developed from. Yes. We're not anti China, we're just pro Taiwan. Yes. You know, so when you, when we mention Taiwan number one, that's a good thing. Everybody in their heart should feel like as a person that they're number one, as a man you're number one, in your job, in your country. So saying number one doesn't mean that anybody else is number two. It's a self pride thing. Davis says what he appreciates most about Taiwan is being treated for who he is, not his skin color, and feeling safe. Um, what it feels it feels like being a Taiwanese, it feels like being human. The things I do now, driving, riding my U-bike around the city, um, stepping outside, going to 7-Eleven at 3 o'clock in the morning, 
Those are things that I can't do or many black Americans cannot do in America. So to be able to come in Taiwan and live a life where I don't have to look over my shoulder, or the cops there, or anybody going to try to hurt me in any type of way, those are things that I enjoy. He also likes Taiwan's healthcare system, Taipei's MRT subway system, and Taiwanese people's friendliness. The Taiwanese people treat people by their characteristics. You know, many, many places judge you by the color of your skin before the character. They judge you here with your character. Before we decide that we think that America or different countries are great, you know, we really need to look inside Taiwan and say, you know, wow. At age 35, he may retire soon, but Davis says he will continue to live in Taiwan and take Taiwanese youngsters on summer camps to Los Angeles to broaden their outlook. Davis says young Taiwanese should travel abroad to see the world to gain a better appreciation of their own country. CNA, New Taipei. So right now, you know, we see Quincy Davis. You know, obviously nationality is just a part of personal identity, you know, but there's also kind of self-identification of, you know, the cultural identity. And you can see here that, you know, Quincy is very proud to be Taiwanese himself. He actually he gave up his U.S. citizenship, you know, became full Taiwanese. And, you know, people ask him, you know, why? Kind of talks about it in this and talks about the 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 beauty of, you know, being in Taiwan, being accepted for who you are. And, you know, one thing to be noted here, Quincy kind of talks about this, and I was going to take this as a small note to talk about. You know, recently in America, due to, you know, the coronavirus, COVID-19, um, there's been a lot of aggressions towards Asians. You know, this isn't just, you know, East Asians. These are, you know, anyone who looks Asian in any way. You know, they're getting these micro, these, these aggressions. I'm not going to say microaggressions. These are just straight up aggressions. And, you know, this is the first time since the early 1900s in Yale Peril in America that, you know, Asians or Asians Americans are starting to experience these kind of aggressions. But it's also to remember that, you know, in America, you know, the blacks, the Hispanic community has been receiving this kind of aggression for and hate for hundreds of years. And so sometimes it is also, you know, as Asian Americans or as Taiwanese Americans, it is for us to, you know, empathize and understand how the people would feel and, you know, also help support them even after these times, understand what it is. So, back to identity. Um, you know, Quincy Davis is also on January 1st, 2019, he became one of the five new Taiwanese that f led the national anthem of the flag, cer flag raising ceremony at the presidential office. You know, here you see five people, you know, Quincy Davis from America, uh, Peter Kenrick from Australia, Yugur Rafi Kar Karlov, Karlova, excuse me for pronunciations, from Turkey, Lily Yang from Burma, Trang Nak Thoi from Vietnam. So, you know, this is a new wave of, you know, Taiwanese. You know, they call them new Taiwanese. Uh, I'm pulling them as new Taiwanese. So today we talked a lot about these, you know, three, four different groups of people. But there's really a difference, you know, in the end, what really matters is that everyone is really just Taiwanese. So instead of grouping them all, really Taiwanese is, is a sense of identification. Someone once asked me, you know, what does it mean to be Taiwanese and whatnot? And I said, well, it's hard to tell you what it is to be Taiwanese, but I can tell you what it's not. You know, being Taiwanese is not by your skin color, by your culture, by your language that you speak. Um, it's also not with just your history. Uh, being Taiwanese is the ability to not say you're from Taiwan, to not say you're Taiwanese. To, it's the freedom to say that you're Chinese, Taiwanese, Hokkien, Hakka, Amis, Ataya, Vietnamese, whatever it may be, you know? So this is, these are all different identities. And in the end, you know, identity is yours alone and it's mine alone and no one else can tell us any other different. But today, we're just kind of talking a little bit about idea to understand um, some ideas, you know, as to these histories of these group of people that came about. So, talking about Taiwan for a while now, uh, this is a huge history, um, but next we're going to talk about a little bit more about Taiwanese Americans. And um, before we hop on, there is a question um, that's being asked uh, and is asking, you know, um, you know, today, why is China not willing to give Taiwan true independence? You know, is it a pride thing? This is, um, let me see, let me see this functionality. Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, this is a question that was being asked. Um, and really, this is, I'd probably say one of the most complex questions, you know, that, they, that there can be, you know, if you figure this out, you can, you know, world peace is probably next. Um, and 
really Taiwanese independence there's a large history that goes with it you know definitely join us as well like next next week I'm going to talk about major events um, that caused Taiwan to be the way it is learn a little bit more about that but you know a short answer really is that from China's point of view there is a sense of national security um, Taiwan is is there's ways to argue whether Taiwan's a part of China or not but and China's point of view, if they lose Taiwan, then essentially there is a national security of other regions that are less stable uh, that could break away and cause you know national security issues and stability. Um, part of it is maybe pride as well too. Um, this is a this is a big topic and to unravel at a different time. Um, little plug next week i'm going to be doing another event um another online live stream about you know major events that kind of shape taiwan as it is today and especially on the international stage so again if there's any questions um thank you hannah for posting the link um make sure to have the caps and you know so please join on if there's any questions please let me know and i can definitely answer that as well too and so next we're going to talk about Taiwanese americans um as Taiwanese americans I think one of the easiest ways to start with numbers. The 2010 U.S. Census, you know, there's 215,441 Taiwanese people, or so says on the census. This is less than the number of Cambodians or Laotians or Hmongs in, Ta- in, in America. Um, and this number, 215,000, I don't know if it's a lot or a few, but in actuality, it is definitely not fully representative of the people that, of Taiwanese people that are in in America. For example, Taiwan has one of the highest number of students who go, come from Taiwan over to America. One thing to be noted is that, you know, the this isn't the census isn't just for citizens, you know, anyone who's here, even just people who are studying here, they can fill the census as well too. You know, as noted by JC right now is that 215,000 there's 215,000 alone in LA. So hopefully more people can fill out uh, the census and, you know, if you're Taiwanese and, you know, whoever, you know, what if you're multicultural or whatever, definitely fill them in. But we're talking about Taiwanese Americans, we can start learning them about in terms of ways of um, ways of immigration that came here. Uh, we'll start from the first generation. When we're talking about first generation, we're talking about people who probably came here for for the, t- the Asian Americans or rather the Taiwanese Americans at the very least. Um, the generation is a little bit weird. Typically, when we talk about first generation, we talk about the first generation that was born in America and raised here. Uh, when we talk about first generation, though, we just talk about people who immigrated here. Um, so a lot of times people, the first generation, they see Taiwan as home and they act very, very strong about it. And they see Taiwan as a home and they want to defend it as well, too. So this is a New York Times article. Um, this is a real thing that happened, was that there was a man by the name of Peter Huang um, in, in, in America uh, at that time, uh, Jiang Jingguo, who was the son of Chiang Kai-shek, essentially came to Taiwan, uh, came to America and, you know, was doing some visits. And Peter Huang, amongst with uh, some couple of other Taiwanese, Taiwanese Americans, wanted to assassinate him. This happened, it just took place in the uh, Plaza Hotel, which was right across in New York City, right across the street from like the really fancy Apple store. At this time, there was no Apple store. Um, and so, you know, they took their hand, like they want to take Taiwan matters into their own hands because Taiwan was their home. But a lot of times you think about like, you know, why, why does this happen? You know, why do they go so far? Why are they so fervent about it? You know, and also some, why do some Taiwanese Americans be like, why my parents or grandparents never talk about a lot of this stuff? So as I'm speaking here, I kind of want to talk about, actually, before we get into that video, um, originally I had that video on mute before, but I thought about it, I really want to show the part of it. Next is going to be a video from, a, a clip from a sh- short documentary uh, called Blacklist, um, made by Christina Hu, who's heading the Ryan Taiwanese um, campaign right now. And, you know, it talks about, you know, you can kind of, this small clip bit of it, where I kind of want to show, you know, why and how Taiwanese identity was kind of lost in America. You know, a lot of this part comes with, Spies. We always know that they are campus spies, spying for Taiwanese students. But we never had any evidence for that. But one year, we found one. Because the person who was reporting for all the student activities, he had a summer intern job in the state government of North Carolina. And when he was reporting student activity, he used the, the state, state government's envelope mailed to a PO bus in New York. That's their security, Taiwanese uh, you know, security. It happens that the PO bus was closed. He didn't know that. The letter was returned to North Carolina to the state government. 
So when the state government is the engineer uh, department, when they opened it, they saw the Chinese character, and they didn't know what was going on. It happened to be there was a Taiwanese uh, working in the department. So they just take, send it to him and say, do you know anything? And it's a report from a student in North Carolina State reporting student activities on campus. 真正确定是黑名单，当然是要申请啊回去台湾的时候，到了家里面，比如说像我父亲生病啊，或者过世啊，都不能回去。那时候才就觉得，才深深的感受那一种啊黑名单的那个缺乏人性。那申请回去台湾的时候，他就不给我护照加签。那我问他说：“为什么？”他就说：“你自己知道啊。”他免得回答就是这样，他也不跟你讲，他就说：“ you know yourself。” 所以， this kind of， um， this kind of。spy work that happened in in america for these taiwanese people you know this happens a lot the first generation and so as time goes on you know it's all there's almost a fear of being taiwanese you know so you know there's also obviously a lot of asian americans talk about the experience of you know their family wanting them just to be american you know forget about the asian part just be american but yet you know for taiwanese you know for example when i was in college i saw a lot of like korean americans they'll be speaking korean at home very proudly korean but yet you know, for I often wonder, like, why Taiwanese Americans there's such a, a fear for that, and understanding this kind of understands why there is that bit of fear. Whether your parents or grandparents are very staunchly pro Taiwan, or even if they're not, they know that by being calling themselves Taiwanese, there comes with certain risks. And with these parents and grandparents, um, this all go into the second generation, and you know. The second generation, as they come about, because their parents were kind of scared of their kids being Taiwanese, um, they go like, "Oh, just you know, just you're you're Asian American, you're Asian, you're American." Uh, but yet, you know, the second generation, there's still kind of a want a com sense of community that wants to be done. Um, one of the questions that's being asked right now is, you know, why you know being Taiwanese, you know, treated so so much worse than anyone who doesn't look, uh, who you know who who wasn't Asian looking. And it really comes about, you know, there's a sense of bullying that happens. You know, for example, one, like, you know, uh, Fresh Off the Boat, for example, um, a couple years ago when it first came out, the, the pilot episode, there was a scene where, you know, Eddie Huang, the main character, Taiwanese American, he goes to school and his mom packed him lunch and it was like it was noodles. And then the kids around him were like, ew, like, what is that? And you know, they, they'd run away from him, kind of ostracize him. And this really comes with a bit of, you know, why, you know, this sense of I don't want to be Asian. You know, and you know, I just want to be American, but there's still a sense of like I want people being with people who kind of look like you, kind of have this some cultural background. So there's a tendency for people to work together, and so the second generation Taiwanese Americans, there slowly is a sense of community there. And so this is, for example, uh, flyers from my college years of you know different events that we had. But at the same time, because we didn't really want to talk about Taiwanese identity, we spent a lot more time on you know social events, you know, having fun, you know, and you know. Didn't really get to understand the cultural part. Of course, times have changed as well too. You know, for example, um, Intercollegiate Taiwanese American Student Association or ITASA, you know, has gone through huge changes over the years. It was founded in the '90s, and you know, from the left, you kind of see the posters that they have talking about you know where we've been, where we are now, where we're going. You know, talking about Taiwan's independence. To kind of now on the right side, you kind of see kind of these different ideas of you know the the conference is now a little bit more about story about recognition. You know, while they're still talking about kind of Asian American topics, um, there's not so much about that distinct Taiwanese ness. Obviously, when you're when you're in private, you're all still talking about a lot of these um, Taiwanese identities. But you know, there's there's kind of a fear of uh, offending because inherently, you know, in the 2000s, for some reason, by saying you're Taiwanese and not Chinese. Um, it becomes offensive, so people wanted to shy away from it. You know, while being Taiwanese American is part of the uh, Asian American diaspora, you know, Taiwanese Taiwanese Americans have this added layer that's a little bit different than you know some Asian a lot of Asian Americans. I was at a I was at a in, uh, Itasa conference once. I was speaking there, and you know, after the conference, I was you know having a drink with the two keynote speakers, 
and they said that you know we're talking and he goes like yeah they were saying like we're actually very surprised that we were asked to speak at a Taiwanese American conference student conference you know because like we told them like like they the two speakers like we're, we're not Taiwanese you know they were you know Vietnamese American Korean American individually and they say you know it, you know but in the end they decided to come you know talk about Asian American topics and you know they're like hey we can learn about Taiwan at this conference a little bit too because a lot of their friends are actually Taiwanese Americans one of them said, yeah, every time I ask my Taiwanese American friends, I'd be like, oh, like, so what's this thing with like Taiwan and China? You know, my, his friend will just reply, oh, it's complicated, you know. And so these conference, because of some of its complications, focus, we focus, tend to be, find it easier to focus on Asian American topics. Um, but, you know, and just avoid some of these, quote unquote, more controversial topics. But, you know, hopefully, as we're demonstrating here today, some of these topics aren't controversial or whatnot. They're just part of, you know, history and things that happened. And so... Finishing that story off, I essentially told him, okay, okay, I'm going to do the one last service. You've come here to the Taiwanese American Conference. What's the one big question you have? I'll answer it. At least you can walk away with one new knowledge about Taiwan. Obviously, they asked about Taiwan and China, and that's a whole other topic, and we'll get to that in a different time, hopefully next week. Um, but slowly, we get to start the third generation. Um, and then, obviously, each of these generations, there's no clear-cut line. There's no, like, this is as ambiguous as, like, Gen Z, millennials, whatever it is. You know, there's intermingling. Like, this picture is actually, you know, nowadays it's kind of a mix between some second generation and some third generations. Um, this picture is from, taken from a Tasa conference. And now, with third generation, it's a little bit different from second generation because nowadays, growing up as Asian American... It, you know, while second generations kind of saw it as kind of being, you know, you get bullied for being Asian. People look at your food funny and whatnot. But nowadays, like, I'm just imagining if you brought, like, sushi or, like, you know, dumplings to school. You're like, oh, my God, what is that? Can I have some? It's almost like starting to be a little bit more cool to be a children of an immigrant. And so third generation kids, now they like, we want to learn about what does it mean to be Taiwanese or Taiwanese American. But then we run into a problem where because you're third generation, your parents, your, your grandparents start, you know, because of the history that's been there, it's hard for them to talk about what it is, you know. So it's really up to not just parents and grandparents, but even just all of us to kind of discuss about what it is, you know, and be able to provide information around that. Nothing's more prevalent than maybe um, in the past couple, uh, past a few months ago. Uh, there was a huge Taiwanese American that was on, you know, American screens. It was on the news all the time. And that man was um, Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang's Taiwanese American, but you almost, I don't think I've ever heard him talk about being Taiwanese American. You know, at a debate once, I was watching one of the debates and he was talking about my parents grew up living on the floor in Asia. You know, um, there's avoidance of it. Obviously, there's, there's you know, um, being a presidential candidate or, or rather a, a Democratic a can, uh, candidate for the Democratic nomination, um, there comes with a little bit of pressure and some things to cater to. But, you know, he never really took the Taiwanese American identity. I do want to highlight someone who does. And um, this is Leona Chen. She's a second generation Taiwanese American, you know, and her family backgrounds comes from Han Taiwanese and also indigenous Taiwanese. And to close off most of this, um, we kind of, I want to talk, read something that is from her. And I think it's really great. And I want to share with everyone. Throughout my own life, the Taiwanese American community has been synonymous with family. The people around me inherently understand Taiwan's culture, uh, Taiwan's culture and history. These were so deeply embedded that we could even claim polariz uh, polarizing political differences within our Taiwanese ethnicities. This upbringing was such a privilege. I'm grateful to my elders and surrounding fam friends for fostering this sense of awareness. But I've come to realize that simply identifying as Taiwanese American or Taiwanese is a political statement with profound implications. Those who do become the few and the proud, involuntary flag bearers and ambassadors for a culture that remains marginalized within the larger Asian American minority, our, identif our identification often requires an explanation. The exhaustion of this has prompted many to defer to a Chinese American identity. But I believe that, <laughs> but I believe that laying claim to a Taiwanese American identity is an act of protest an echo of a continual fight to preserve democracy and nationality. We affirm our country's agency when we resist the convenience of its erasure. This is pivotal work. I salute those who declare allegiance to a non-negotiable Taiwanese American identity. I salute my mother and her cousins, whose ownership of an Aboriginal lineage was the first of many acts of protest in Taiwan. 
Above all else, they have taught me that a cultural a culture is carried by its people. Our embarrassment, shame, or mere laziness to claim our identities is destructive to our own history. To my Taiwanese American brothers and sisters, understand.